that current flow takes the shortest route. So, for instance, as this passes across, if it comes across two bars, I will get a current flow through one bar, out the other bar, and so on. Okay, so as it rotates, now with the rotor sitting still, this rotation will be at the line frequency, or let's say 60 hertz. So as this is turning at 60 hertz, it generates a current inside the rotor at 60 hertz. This causes an extremely high current, which is then seen, if you were measuring with an amp probe, on the outside of the motor as four to eight times the motor rated current. This is where the current comes from as the motor, uh, as you start the motor. The inrush current at four to eight times, which as the rotor begins to turn, the magnetic fields cross it, cross each bar fewer and fewer times. The rotor frequency begins to drop and current drops along with it. So the other reason why when you get up to speed, as you vary your load, you notice the RPM of the motor will increase and decrease away from the nameplate uh, information, and the current will also increase and decrease. That's directly related to how quickly the magnetic fields are crossing each one of the bars. This also explains why you can never reach that synchronous speed. Uh, the reason why is because you always have to have the magnetic fields crossing the bars, or you can't generate any torque. This all causes the rotor cage itself to start turning. This rotor cage is attached to the laminations, which are then attached to the shaft of the rotor, and it all turns. Altogether, you end up with a system. What's really neat about this motor system is that the in electrical signature now, well, let me put it back up a bit. If I were doing vibration analysis, I would put my vibration transducer above the bearing, which is attached to the shaft of the motor. What I'm measuring in vibration is movement within that transducer of a little pie, piezoelectric cell, which generates a little current, which is amplified and sent back to my vibration analyzer. In electrical signature an analysis, you are actually using the electric motor and the air gap between the rotor and the stator as your transducer. Electrical signature analysis is a little bit more than what you have commonly seen in magazines as motor current signature analysis. And nowadays, virtually all of the manufacturers of motor current signature analysis equipment are actually electrical signature analysis instruments. The electrical signature analysis consists of several components. One is motor current signature analysis, which is the small uh, circle in the lower left there. Um, that was primarily developed in the past to identify broken rotor bars and machines. The larger system current signature analysis is the methodology used to detect mechanical system issues and electric motor system issues. Power quality analysis identifies things like harmonics and other issues upstream in the system. And then system voltage signature analysis detects problems with voltage. What's key when you're doing electrical signature analysis is when you, wherever you can uh, connect your current transformers and your voltage um, transducers, <coughs> at whatever point you connect those, Everything that is measured in voltage is coming from upstream towards the generator. Whatever you're testing in current is coming back from the electric motor. So voltage is upstream, current is downstream. This can be very important because when you're te checking for problems in an electric motor and you see certain signatures that are dominant in voltage, that means that it's not the electric motor that's identifying that particular problem, if it is a problem. It is something somewhere else in the supply system. It also means that if I'm doing a generator test, I do not perform current signature analysis. I instead perform voltage signature analysis. 
This also comes in important if you're testing the output side of a variable frequency drive or a DC drive. Anything I see in the voltage signature is coming from the drive itself. Anything I see in current is coming from the driven equipment. So let's talk about our real transducer. Our real transducer is the magnetic field in the air gap of the machine we're testing. Now if I'm testing a 400 horsepower motor, I probably have 40 to 60,000 spacing between the rotor and the stator itself. That air gap, that small space, is carrying all 400 horsepower worth of magnetic field. That is where all the energy is coming from. What's important about using these fields is something called the inverse square law. That means the strength of the field decreases by the square of the distance from the source. So if something happens and my rotor moves further and further away from a coil that's generating um, a field and as a result a current, uh, I will get a change in that current and in that magnetic field interaction between the stator and rotor. Line frequency is provided to the motor as voltage. Now, if that voltage is perfectly sinusoidal and it comes to the motor, everything that comes out from the motor and current that's other than sinusoidal is indications of operating conditions within the machine and from the rotor outwards. So basically, the air gap is a fault generator. Okay, and the line frequency acts as my carrier frequency. And for those of you who like to follow this stuff, because I'm going to cover it in a few minutes, what we're actually looking at is AM, ampl amplitude modulation. Now, this is another animation. I'm hoping that it, uh, it, it's fairly balanced. You should see a rotating portion within a circle with several arrows on the outside of it. This would indicate a good air gap where everything is even and the magnetic fields are of even strength. So in this particular situation, if I have a clean sinusoidal voltage coming in, I should have a clean sinusoidal current coming back out. One of those most common problems in an electric motor is something called static eccentricity. Smaller motors, it's difficult to get them perfectly centered, so this will sometimes show up. Now, what's important about this is as we develop our information, if I know the number of rotor bars in this particular rotor, and I know the RPM, which, I, which in electrical signature analysis is normally shown as frequency, I can take the number of rotor bars times the frequency and come up with a value. Now, what I actually show up, what will actually show up in electrical signature analysis is the number of rotor bars times running speed plus line frequency minus twice line frequency. So whatever that center point is, plus or minus 60 hertz in a 60 hertz system. Another common problem is something called dynamic eccentricity. This is where the rotor stays close to one side. It's, it's got uh, eccentricity, but it, that eccentricity rotates with the, uh, with the motor. This will show up similar to static eccentricity, except around the uh, side bands on your fast Fourier transformer, uh, which we'll show in a little bit. You will actually see running speed side bands as well. The reason why is because you have this eccentricity happening at the running speed. Why does this happen? Well, it happens because, in reality, the rotor and the shaft are not solid systems. The rotor, uh, the shaft itself, is elastic. It will move, and the rotor itself will move inside the magnetic field from side to side. So uh, if I were to look inside the motor, and I were to have an external force on the rotor, it will be moving inside that magnetic field from side to side. And as it approaches one side or another, I get a strengthening and, and uh, lessening 